Assalamu alaikum fam, hope you're doing well. Let's continue our reading and overall book review, deep dive into Hamza Yusuf's Purification of the Heart. It's his commentary of Imam al Mawalud's Mahra al Kalub. Um, I am not a Sufi, but this book has just been thought provoking, right? And it's just really interesting and nerdy. So we're just going to read it and dig into it, see what he has to say, and just learn something in general. Okay, mashallah. All right. Imam al Haythami relates that having extended hope, Tatawil al Amal is founded on heedlessness of reality of death. Okay, so extended hope is linked to heedlessness of the reality of death. Quite interesting. Which he said is not wrong in and of itself. There is no commandment that obliges the remembrance of death, although it is difficult to imagine a spiritual life without such reflection. True, I feel like if you're more spiritual, you think about death a lot. I think it's very important, really puts things into perspective, right? Thinking about how you're going to be reunited with Allah and how you're going to be held accountable for everything that you did and you won't be a slave to your boss or to your government or to your hedonistic passions. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, remember death. And he said, I used to tell you do not visit graves. Now I tell you to visit graves because it will remind you of the hereafter. True that. Although these commands do not rise to the level of obligation, they are considered highly recommended mandub the same way that the remembrance of God beyond what is prescribed is recommended but not obligatory per se. So the, again, the nuances of what is recommended, what is obligatory. All of us should visit graves. I've taken my little one to graveyards. Funerals are very important for the recognition of the cycle of life, I'd argue. That's why I always get curious with how atheists deal with the topic. They usually roll into cynicism and nihilism. Then, you have a very interesting analysis you can do upon that as well. The Quran states that there are people who desire to continue in their wrongdoing throughout the entirety of their lives. They ask, when will this day of resurrection come? Quran 75.6 One interpretation of this verse, according to scholars, is that although people may be aware of ultimate accountability, here's the new phrase, ultimate accountability, I kind of like that. The day of accounting, day of judgment, ultimate accountability, they put off repentance as if they are guaranteed a long life. See, this is interesting. Because how many times a day did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ask for forgiveness? Every time I do my prayers, I ask for forgiveness. Every time I come out of the bathroom, I say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Uh, I read to do that in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Right? I read to, when you go into the bathroom, you ask for protection. When you exit it, you say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Right? You never know when you're going to die. Ask for forgiveness as much as possible because... You may have committed something wrong knowingly or unknowingly. Cover your bases, right? This is an ethic exemplified by the saying, sow your wild oats, which advocates getting all the lewdness and sin out of one's life when one is young, and then later calming down and adopting religion. Yes, I've heard this. And this is the hedonism of liberalism and atheism. Um... I regret ever believing that that was a systematic way of living life. But may God help everyone to realize that the feminist liberal atheists are completely wrong. And all you do is stack up bad memories, mental illness. And, you know, I don't like the red pill people, but they have a point when they say that, you know, if a certain woman has reached a threshold of intimate partners... Let's say you go to like the TikTok challengers of like 213 men. 
you're getting into just dystopian levels, right? By that time, you probably have a disease. You probably had a few abortions, bad memories, traumatic experiences. It's just quite depressing. I once heard of a woman, she told me she had over 600 men. I mean, jeez. Ugh. Ugh, it's disgusting. You know, so we really have to be careful. We should not recommend that type of lifestyle anymore. A lot of liberals don't want people to get married young. They want them to experience what they say the world and partners. Neglecting how those women, mostly the women, the men it's just a different psychology. But for women it's like they could just sit around at the bar drinking, you know, cheap Chardonnay, talking about all their former lovers and, you know, they smell like cigarettes. It's just not a classy look, you know? It's quite dystopian. Ugh. Besides the obvious error of this ethic, another terrible flaw is that people die at all ages, and some never get the chance to repent and make amends. True. You know, you, you never know when you're going to die. Ask for forgiveness. Try to live your life as best as you can, right? Do, strive every day to perfect yourself. Moreover, what kind of repentance is this when people intentionally indulge in sin, banking on the possibility that later on in life, after all the energy and drive of diminishes, they will turn in penitence to God? Yeah, it's interesting. Don't tell them just to wild out and to bet on repentance. Caution and say, you slip up, you slip up, right? But don't say all I'm going to do and then just going to repent because it's not sincere it's not ikhlas like you're what are you doing you know we know that God loves those who spend their youth obedient to him and his commandments Imam Maulud mentions next the concept of divination and foreboding tatayur when the pre-Islamic Arabs needed to decide upon something they would run toward a flock of birds. <laughs> why? Why? If the flock veered to the left, they took this to be a bad omen. If it to the right, it was a good omen. That's ridiculous. That's <laughs> uh, funny. Because if you're going to... How you approach it, you can just kind of like how the angle of how they'll go. Also, what's in front of them will also determine which way they're going to fly. <laughs> so stupid. Foreboding is blatant superstition. Totally. The Arabic word mutatayir, Arabic, refers to someone who is pessimist, who always sees the worst in any given situation. Yeah, those people are really Debbie Downers, aren't they? Imam Maulud says that superstition is lack of knowledge, that everything belongs to God. Interesting. Superstition and lack of knowledge. It can get kind of a little OCD sometimes, right? You're like, you know, you can kind of... Is it this or is it that? But we're not supposed to find omens in birds. I remember reading that in Buhari. We're not supposed to find omens in that. All affairs are his. Having a good opinion of God produces a view on him that is impregnable to negative thoughts and behaviors that thrive in the soil of disbelief. I like how he says thrive in the soil of disbelief because it kind of starts from a seed of doubt or some negative view and then turns into this like whoa like bearing the negative poisonous fruit right I think mentioning God's names and learning them that also helps us have a good opinion of God and color the good and the bad of it having patience having sabr is another angle that help us to not have these over negative thoughts of wallowing and self-pity the weaker people love being like whiny little victim olympians and you know whining about how the life is hard therefore god is cruel therefore god is evil when in reality you need to look at all the other blessings and someone who has it worse than you and even know the people who have it better than you in some ways still have their own struggles that maybe you can't handle better than them and other things that you can handle better than them so the nuances of how you suffer in degrees is something to really 
reflect upon. So controlling your negative thoughts concerning Allah Asawajal, is very important. To hang on to superstitions is to have a negative understanding of the reality of God and his authority and presence. Very interesting. Because superstitions also go into... There's reasonable suspicions, but not superstitions. You see the difference? Suspicions versus superstitions. Right? Like, ah! Like people who see a, you know, they walk under a ladder. And they're like, oh, if you walk under a ladder. Or if you break a mirror, you'll have seven years of bad luck. Really stupid things like that that come from stories. Come from folk tales. There are two types of foreboding. One is based on normative experience. Observing things that consistently happen. For example, getting near a cobra usually results in it striking the person. Hence... If one sees a cobra, one should get out of the way, right? Or be like the the crocodile hunter, right? Oh, not crocodile Dundee. The crocodile hunter who was from Australia, mate, and he used to like go after the snakes. Um, oh, then he'd probably go for it, but we should get out of the way. There is no superstition in that. Well, yeah, because the cobra is poisonous, going to bite you, it's not going to be very good. You know, get it out of the way, move. But this differs completely from some practices like avoiding walking under a ladder. Hey, I just said that. <laughs> Staying clear of a black cat and the culture that has evolved around the number 13. Oh, yeah, I've seen it in haunted hotels. It's like a satanic number, they'd say. Uh, yeah, like I've seen some haunted houses that had like number 13. Ooh, I'm like, <laughs> whatever. And it's association with bad luck. Yeah. Similar is the stigma connected with breaking a mirror. Hey, that's funny that I just named some of this here. Yeah, those kind of silly little Irish folk tales. I think those originate from... If you ever read Celtic tales? I have a couple. Well, I don't know where the book is. I don't know where I put it. But there's some funny things because the Irish immigrants came over. And they brought their little leprechaun tales over. I really produced that. I had a black cat. Her name was Medusa. She was really sweet. She was old. Even the seemingly harmless knock on wood originates from pagan practices of worshipping trees. Yeah, I have to work on not saying that. Really gotta work on that. I used to say knock on wood. Well, I can't say it anymore. It's not. It's not hello. These superstitions emanate from having a bad opinion of God, not recognizing his power and authority in the world. Attributing power to inanimate objects. Oh, that's tr interesting. Hold up, pause on that for a second. Shirk. It's like a level of shirk, right? That's why studying Tawheed is important to me. Because you realize, like, this stupid little totem isn't going to do jack crap to me. It's Allah who has the decision, right? But the inanimate objects, like the mirror, the ladder, not knocking on wood, these are colloquial terms in our natural language of, you know, culture that have continued through time because of their abundant usage. But we as Muslims have to sift that out, right? Knock on wood when I gotta work on that. Delving into other similar practices, such superstitions are explicitly forbidden in Islam. Good thing to notice. Superstition is not something that we as Muslims should do. To be suspicious of something, right? To give a hypothesis, to theorize, rational. Superstitions? No. Watch out. I also have heard silly ones, like if you don't wear a white dress at your wedding, if you wear a different color, your marriage will be cursed. And it's like... I get that the white is supposed to be symbolic of a virgin of impurity and black is for a funeral, red is like you're a dirty, you know, woman, so it's like, hmm, it's strange. Or if a bridesmaid wears a white gown uh, and the bride wears a white gown that the wedding will go off and that the bridesmaid should have different colors of dresses. And if the woman decides to wear the same color as the bride, she's an evil woman, she's envious, she's a harlot. There's all these weird things, right? So, watch out for that. <laughs> Crazy, right? 
So foreboding, divination, and foreboding are tatayur. Wow, interesting. So that was from the pre-Islamic Arabs. <laughs> interesting. And then the Arabic word mutatayir, that is someone who is a pessimist. So we have to watch out for that one. M-U-T-A-T-A-Y-Y-I-R. Interesting. May we all avoid being pessimists.